Hello and welcome to Infamous Items. Now I told myself that I was going to make a few more of these infamous items. So we're going to take a look at something that I've had for a while. I kind of uh, like infamy. I like things that have infamy, like I was saying on my last video. And we're going to take a look at this item. And it actually is a very infamous item. It's not an evil infamous item. It's just a very historic item uh, that was used during the 1960s. So I'll give you a kind of a hint when the period is that this item comes from. And uh, we're going to do a video about it. We're going to uh, definitely talk about the item. We're going to look at the item. And it's one item this time. It's not a multitude of items that I showed last time. Now, uh, 1964, that's when this item comes from. As we all know, uh, President Kennedy. I know there's a lot of people out there that like President Kennedy. Uh, there's a lot of people uh, that are still looking at the assassination. And they're looking at conspiracy theories. There's a lot of people that believe in different theories and so forth. But we're going to take a look at one particular item on this list. Now, the drums, the bells, and the whistles again. Here it is. This is the camera that Abraham Zapruder used to film the 1964 assassination of President Kennedy. Now, if we look at this uh, camera, it's a basic camera. If you turn it around, get different angles of it. Okay, this is the back of the camera. And I'll leave it like this because it's such an interesting artifact. It's absolutely incredible that these cameras from the 60s are still around. Now, when you look at this camera, and I, I do did look at it multiple times, uh, there's really not too thing, anything too uh, special about it. It is made by Bell and Howell. If you ever see commercials on the internet or TV, uh, the Bell and Howell, like those glasses you wear to see at night, and you know they sell infomercial type of items. But back then, Bell and Howell was a name to be reckoned with. And this camera, this director series, Zoomatic camera. Uh, was the top of the line for video cameras, uh, eight millimeter, not video cameras. Now these are reel-to-reel -reel cameras. This is an eight millimeter camera that used reel-to-reel -reel film. Okay, and uh, you know they changed the cameras in the years, but we're going to be talking about this camera, what this played in history, and uh, how uh, this camera became infamous. I'll get back with you. Okay, we're looking at the Zapruder camera now. Now, I want to go over a few of the basic um, functions of this camera before we get into the history of it. Now, the Zapruder camera is a box camera. It's very bulky. It's extremely heavy for its time. Uh, compared to cameras today, uh, it's all metal. It has no plastic on it. Uh, it is a camera, probably made in Japan. Don't quote me on that one. But we're going to take a look at the inside of the camera. If you open the camera up, there was two versions of this camera. Now, this one is the Director Series Zoomatic. That is the camera that Zapruder used to film the assassination of President Kennedy. If you look at this, it was a reel-to-reel. -reel. This is the take-up spool right here. And then you would put the unused roll of film in here, right in this area here. You would open up the door here. You would unroll the leader. Now, the leader was not exposed because this is open. As soon as that unexposed film is, is in the air, you're going to expose the film. This probably had a long leader on it that you can roll up so you didn't expose the film. You would only start to expose the film when you close this up and you start it winding and, and you use the little bit, uh, a little bit of, of the roll to get into that film. Now the leader could be, I would say, maybe, uh, I don't know how long it would be, maybe about 13 14 inches long the leader would be. So you would take your roll of film and it was a Kodak film. Uh, it wasn't chromatic or anything like that. There was a specific film that Zapruder used. I think I'm going to have to look that up and we'll find out what that was. Now this is 8 millimeter home reels. Now if any of you have uh, your grandparents or uh, you know even into the 70s they started still using 8 millimeter. There's a lot of home video that were shot on cameras like these. Uh, 
uh, there was different types of cameras. There's Argus. There was different uh, uh, different types of manufacturers that used this. This is the Bell and Howell. This is the probably the best video eight millimeter camera in 1964 during that time. Very well made camera. So we're going to take a look at the inside of the camera. Like I said, there's a take up spool that you would roll the leader into, and then when the film, you would put the film strip through this, this is the lens, and then you would shut it, and then it would be ready to go. You would close it, lock it, and then what you would do is you'd roll this around, and there's a lever on here. You would take this lever, you would pull it down, and if you see right here, I don't know if you can see it, but right here there's a little meter right here, right where my top of my finger is. Now what that does is it is an indicator of how much winding speed and time you have left. It's not a timer, it's just winding speed. So here's how you roll it. You take it and you, it doesn't feel like there's any resistance, but you are actually physically winding this camera. You're winding the spring up to give this camera speed. You're giving it the speed to go through the film, and you're also uh, you're giving it the speed to operate the manual. No, it, it's an automatic zoom. Uh, I guess it would be manual, but you had to push the buttons and it would zoom in and out. So you turn this, just like this. And as I'm turning it, you'll notice that this meter that I was talking about is starting to turn red. Now, when that red line gets all the way over, all the way over here, that means that it's ready to go. But we'll, we'll feel something else. As I'm turning and turning and turning, watching the red meter go up and up and up, You'll notice something. If you're watching now, it stopped. It locked. It tells you exactly when it's done. So you take the, the arm and you put it back into the camera. Put it back in so you don't have that to bump against. And if you notice here, the red line is completely across now. It's completely across. That means that it's charged and the spring is fully wound. Now, there is a timer on this. It says start and end. And it looks like it's about 25 seconds depending upon the length of film that you did use. You can use uh, a small amount of eight millimeter or you can use the full 25 seconds, which I think this went through about 25 seconds. Don't quote me on that, but there's definitely a time frame on different types of spools. Now the Sapruder film had so many frames. I think it went up to 400 and some frames. And uh, he had filmed this movie on this camera and he had a full roll of film. Now, keep talking. I'm going to keep talking about this camera here and the functions of it. If you look right here, uh, there's animation button that advances the roll one frame at a time. One frame, one frame, one frame. And that's for stop motion. If you want to move or change your position, you'll see like it'll be like uh, the Roboto. That's what animation is. Then you have the full run. You don't push it all the way down. That's running on 8mm. That's quite a historic sound, as we know. that That's what the sound Abraham Zapruder heard on top of that pedestal in Deedley Plaza when he was filming the assassination. It would have been this sound. Now, as I'm doing that, I'm noticing that my counter here, my film counter, is counting down. It was at start when I started it. And now it's at a little under seven. So that's giving you the time that you have left on this roll because you cannot physically look into this camera and say, oh, I only have half a roll of film left. The only thing that you have to evaluate that roll is this counter on the roll. And also it had slow motion. Now slow motion we think would slow the film down, but slow motion works by speeding the film through the, the through the lens, and when you're speeding the, the film through the lens, it goes slow when you produce it. That's this sound. And that eats up a lot of film. You go through film really quick on slow motion. That's slow motion. That's animation. It goes frame by frame. And then this is regular. So that's, the, that's basically how you wind the camera and that you 
physically uh, uh, judge the camera and how you use the camera. Now I'm going to wind this too because I have to keep it fully wound to show you the next, uh, next aspect of this Zoomatic Bell and Howell. The infamous Zoom and, and the, the Director Series, the infamous Zoomatic, the Zoomatic camera. So he, usually what you're going to do is you're going to put one hand on the top and one hand on the bottom. There is a viewfinder in the back of this camera. As you see, it's very small, but it's functional. The view camera, the viewfinder goes through the front. It's just magnified maybe three or four times from the back. It's magnified. And also this has a dual electric eye, which was, it had to be revolutionary at the time. You're talking the early, mid 60s. This electric eye uh, judged how much uh, sun was out there or how much shade and basically would, uh, you know, just make your pictures in frame. It would give you that kind of contrast that was perfect for any shooting conditions, either cloudy or if, if it was really sunny out. This this electric eye knew that and it adjusted the, the lens for that. So there was an option for this camera that Zapruder did not have when he got this camera. Uh, I don't know if he had the option for it, but if you look underneath, it has the standard quarter-inch tripod mount, which is right here. It's a screwed tripod mount, but also you could have got an accessory for this underneath. Now, this had a pistol grip. That's what they called it. It was a grip that screwed onto this, and you would basically hold it. It would be forward, and you'd be able to hold on to this and steady it, and then hold this, and then look through the viewfinder as you're holding that pistol grip. Now, from the photographs that I see of Sapruta on the grassy knoll, he does not have that grip. He's holding the camera with his right hand on the bottom and his left hand is on top and his fingers are on these two buttons on top. Now, these two buttons are the zoom in and zoom out buttons. Now, I don't think so. After watch reviewing that film, that, that Dealey Plaza film, he did not really zoom in and out. He kept the zoom steady. He didn't do any funny stuff. He filmed from the beginning to the end, and we'll get into that. But this is the, just the features of the camera. So basically, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to zoom in, and you're basically going to see this lens rotate left and rotate right, depending upon if I'm zooming in or out. Now, this is how you hold the camera. This is exactly how he would have held the camera in Dealey Plaza. Now, I'm going to start it, and I'm going to zoom out. That's fully back. Now I'm going to zoom towards, which is about a 4 to 5x zoom. It's getting really close in. And as you see, the lens is turning left and right. But this is how he would have held the camera. You would have heard this noise. He would have been holding it like this. That's history in motion right there. There's nothing like that. That is history in motion. Now... There's a slight, slight difference between this camera and Zapruder's camera. Now, it's the same exact model. His camera was an early release from 64. This is about a release maybe a few months later. They tweaked a couple things that they didn't like on it and improved the camera. And what the improvements are is that this camera does not have a... Uh, it was a manual zoom. This is a manual zoom camera. You don't need to use these buttons. These are only for slow motion move. I mean, slow motion zoom or, or, or it just has a certain motion. This you can focus at any speed. You can go in and out to a person's face very quickly while you're filming. But his camera, Zapruder's camera, had a little handle that came out here. So you could do that manually like this back and forth you didn't have to have your hand on the lens they figured that was a problem because you would bump against it or if you were filming and you hit it it would it would zoom in and wreck the the frame of your film and also his camera this side this side of the camera there was a piece of metal foil that went across this area right here right at the bottom and that said director series that was it it only said director series and then another thing about his camera was that here it says Bell and Howell in the front and it says Director Series Zoomatic. The only thing in the front of, of his camera was Zoomatic. That's all it said here. But otherwise, this camera is exactly the same camera that he used in Dealey Plaza to film that infamous um, 
30 or 40 seconds of framing of film. Now, looking at it, it's it, like I said, it's a very heavy camera. So we went over the, the features of this camera. We looked at everything about it. Its exposure rate was good. It was high. It had a good lens. It was uh, looks like it has a coating on it, a UV coating on the lens, so you didn't get a lot of reflective uh, sunlight into the camera when you were filming. And the only downfall, and they did change this with this Bell & Hound about in the next year's model. And probably around 65 or 66 when they were still making this style of camera. They, Kodak changed over the film. This is what Sapruta would have saw when he opened his camera up. He would have put his film in here and he would have been able to manually wind it. Now, the next year's model, they took this out and then they had a cartridge. They didn't even have this where you would put the film. This is like an old film projector at school. You would open up the bail, put the film through, and then close it and then put it onto the reel. The new ones had a cassette that went in here. It was a cassette that was pre, it, it, it had the film in there. It was it was never gonna be exposed. You couldn't expose it like you could do this. All you could do is unroll this and it would have been literally worthless. It would have been exposed to sunlight. Now be having it being in there and having it be encased it was a lot easier, number one. Two, it didn't damage your film at all. Even for an amateur, they just put the cassette in. It was like, uh, you know, using a 110 film strip in the 1980s. Instead of pulling the 35 millimeter film, you know, they changed it now for amateurs to use a little cassette. They put the cassette in, they closed it, they turned it like that, and they advanced it a few frames, maybe about 14, maybe maybe 10 seconds, advance it, so you can start getting the film going. Extremely easy, extremely efficient, but that's not what Zapruta had. He had the reel-to-reel. -reel. He had this. He had the reel-to-reel. -reel. Now, I'm going to take a break right now, and uh, I'm going to come back, and what we're going to talk about is Zapruta himself. Who is this man that shot this, this intimate f footage, this, this footage that is so infamous today? Okay, who was Abraham Sapruta? Who was this man that we all think of that was uh, so involved in the Kennedy assassination? Whenever we hear about John F. Kennedy and that motorcade, the first thing that comes up is Kennedy, Jackie Kennedy, and Abraham Sapruta. They all go hand in hand. How can somebody that is a seamstress. He was definitely in the dress game. He was a seamstress. He did work in the garment industry. How did this man get so infamous in history? Now, he didn't live very long, but we'll get into that later. But he did a lot of things after the film that made him really, uh, he was a very decent man. Now, he was an immigrant. He he came to New York City. He was from Ukraine. Uh, I, guess, I think it's Kovel, K-O-V-E-L. He came from that city, that Russian, uh, it wasn't, uh, I don't think it was Ukraine at the, at the time, but it was a Russian province at the time. Now, looking through everything, it's, uh, you know, we're looking at everything. You know, it, it, we look at this camera, this camera here. Now, when the Kennedys came into Dallas that day, they flew in on the 7, it was a 740, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was a 7, I guess it was a 737 or a 7, it was, a, no, I'm sorry, it was a 707, it was a presidential plane, that was Kennedy's plane. It had uh, blue, it had silver, which was just aluminum, and it was white, and it had the presidential seal as we see today on aircraft. Now, when that aircraft landed at, at, at Love Field, Okay, that plane, uh, we saw film of this, we saw film, uh, we saw Jackie Kennedy getting flowers, we also saw Jack Kennedy and, you know, things like that. He was there, he was uh, ex extremely popular during that time, we all know this. We saw him get into his open-topped limousine. Now, this limousine was not bolt-resistant, it was open top. Uh, you know, you can see President Kennedy in all his glory. It's not like the beast today that, you know, Donald Trump drives around in or the other presidents did. You know, it's a completely different scenario. This was the 60s. People just believed that they were safe. They didn't, nothing like this was ever going to happen. And I'm sure Kennedy didn't think that anything was going to happen. 
So we see that footage of him getting out, and we also see what I wanted to describe as the weather. The weather that day when they landed, it was rainy and it was overcast. Now, if you talk to any person from Texas, they're always going to say, if you don't like the weather, just wait 10 minutes. And this is what happened on that day. Now, during the day, uh, Abraham Sapruda went into, uh, he went into work that morning, and he had the assumption that he was going to take a video or, or take a, a 8 millimeter film of President Kennedy uh, because he liked him. He was a, a Democrat. But he was looking at the weather, and he kind of didn't take his camera. He left the camera that he had. I think he left it home that day because he thought he wasn't going to get the proper shots that he, he was going to get with this camera. So he left it home. Now, when you think about that, that's like, if you can go back into history and, and, and have something like that, it's, it's lost forever. But what happened was that day it started to clear and he was at work. Now he worked right across the street in the garment industry. I don't know exactly what the name of the building was. I'm sure there was a name to it. Uh, you know, and it brightened up that day. It did. It brightened up very nice. And it, it basically, uh, his secretary, he had a secretary that worked for him. They were working across the street from um, the Texas School Bucks Suppository, I'm sorry. And she convinced him to say, look, the weather got better. Why don't you get your camera? Because you're going to be, this is where that parade route, it's going to go right by your office. So it took a little bit of convincing, but she convinced him to go home and get his camera. He went home and he got it. He, he, he relented, and uh, he definitely uh, went out, and he tried to find a good vantage point to set up and to film. And uh, basically, we know that when the motorcade came through, that he was early on the scene because that uh, portion of that wall that he was standing on was uh, it was perfect for filming that if, if anybody was to film anything in Dealey Plaza it would have been on that that knoll that stuck out the grassy knoll had a uh, it had a concrete uh, structure I don't know what it was exactly called but there was a piece that jutted out from that and it was the same height as the wall so he didn't wasn't standing on the wall he was standing on an abutterment sticking out of that wall now we all know about you know the motorcade and how it was uh, getting near the building and we know all about the assassination but we want to take a look at how this, this is the camera we're going to talk about. I mean, because we know, I mean, there's so many different things you can look up about the Kenny assassination, where they were. That's not about this video. We're looking at infamous things and infamous items, and which this camera is a part of history, even though it's not the exact one. It's still a, a part of history. Now, when he started filming, okay, uh, he filmed uh, an enormous piece of history. Now, he was, now, Abraham Sapruda himself was uh, a mid-aged man. Uh, he was a balding man. He was a larger man. But when he stood up on the abutment, he had his secretary with him. Now, he suffered from vertigo. He, he would go back and forth, and, you know, she was worried that him being up on top of that abutment, that he would fall or something would happen to him. And in the original video of other people in Daly Plaza, you'll see Sapruder filming and you'll see the secretary behind him and she's holding on to the back of his shirt. She has his jacket, she's trying to steady him in case something happens. And when the motorcade was right at the school book depository and made that left and started coming down the road, Zapruder pressed this button. He pressed the button of infamy right here in this camera. He hit the button, he pushed this button, he looked through the lens, just like I'm doing now. He put his hands on the camera like this, he steadied himself with his bottom hand, he steadied himself with his top, and he didn't zoom. He just hit the button, and he filmed those infamous frames of 8 millimeter film that we see today. Now, I'm going to show you the, the Abraham Sapruda film. I'm going to show you the film from the beginning to the end. Now, I do want to advise you that this is uh, not for children. Uh, it's non-edited. 
and uh, like I said, I don't want to edit this out because it is what I wanted to talk about, the Sapruder camera. I want to see from frame uh, one all the way up to when he uh, stopped filming. Okay, we're going to take a look at that film right now. Wow. I mean, that, that says it all. I mean, that is just, that's it. That is the Zapruder film in color in eight millimeter with all the lines, the bells and whistles. Absolutely. Now that was probably recorded many, many times over that film. So you got a lot of uh, fuzz and, and lines and, and, and different things on the film itself. But that is the original. That's the original Zapruder film. Uh, in all its glory, in all its horror, but that's that's the film that was filmed with this camera right here. It was filmed with this Zoomatic, Bell and Hal Zoomatic. Now, after after this was all done and said, Zapruder uh, and many others like him, uh, you know, they all wondered. They were all in shock about what happened. They were wondering, and he's holding on to this camera, probably going from person to person. Uh, you know, oh my God, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a horrible thing. But he doesn't know that he has in his hands what is the most valuable film on the face of the earth. There's no other film for the United States that is the most valuable piece of information that shows from start to finish that assassination attempt. And he has it in his camera. So what does he do? So uh, basically, he's actually looking for other people. He's talking to other people. He's, uh, you know, um, uh, his secretary was crying, and uh, you know, he was distraught himself, and and they kind of didn't know exactly what happened. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you. This is an interview with Abraham Sapruda, uh, probably about I would say an hour, not even an hour, maybe possibly two hours after the film was filmed. Now he had his camera with him during this interview with the local TV station, and they even asked him on film. Uh, he is a Abraham Sapruda says to the uh, reporter that, oh yeah, it's over here. I have the the footage in my camera, and he's. And one of the reporters is like, oh, we'll get that developed for you. Don't worry about it. This is before any FBI or anybody else knew that this man had this film. He even himself didn't know. But he went on, on live TV and he explained exactly what he saw. Now let's take a look at some of that footage. A gentleman just walked in our studio that I am meeting for the first time as well as you. This is WFA TV in Dallas, Texas. May I have your name, please, sir? My name is Abraham Zapruda. Mr. Zapruda? Zapruda, yes, sir. Zapruda, and would you tell us your story, please, sir? I got out in, uh, about a half hour earlier and get into a good spot to shoot some pictures. And I found a spot, one of these uh, concrete blocks that I have down near that park near the underpass. And I got on top there, there was another girl from my office, she was right behind me. And as I was shooting, as the president was coming down from Houston Street making his turn, it was about a halfway down there, I had a shot. And he slumped to the side, like this. Then I had another shot or two, I couldn't say it was one or two. And I saw his head practically open up, all blood and everything, and I kept on shooting. That's about all. I'm just sick again. I think that pretty well expresses the entire yeah. feelings of Terrible. the whole world. Terrible. You have the film in your camera. We'll try yes, to get, I brought it on the studio right now. We'll try to get that processed and have it as soon as possible. Right now, we have videotape. Uh, a picture of the building of where the uh, bullet came from. Let's take the picture first, then the videotape. Uh, this is videotape now. This is a picture of the Hearst leaving... Uh, Parkland Hospital with President Kennedy's body. As I understand it, uh, the body is being taken to one of the funeral homes here in Dallas.
All right, that, Bob, that pretty well covers it, I think. This is the same hospital that President Kennedy visited in his visit here in 1961. It is not. Excuse me. He went. This is the outside shot of the hospital and the people who are gathered there. All stunned in the realization that President Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas today. Now we have a picture of the building. There's a picture of the building that one of the boys took showing uh, possibly one of the windows that, the, uh, that, the, uh, that was used. The top right hand. Okay, which one, which one was it? Uh, let's see if we can figure it out. There it is. There is a picture of the window where the gun was uh, allegedly fired from that killed President Kennedy been the line of fire today. Excuse me, go ahead, sir. That must have been the line of fire where I see now the picture where it was. I was right on that uh, concrete block, as I said. And as I explained before, as a second scene, at first I thought perhaps it's a, uh, it sounded like uh, somebody make a joke, you hear a, a shot and somebody grabs their stomach. I was about 100 yards away from uh, one of our other, the boy and I walked over to see President Kennedy. We were about 100 yards away and it sounded like there were three shots. And after the first couple, I said, uh, uh, my God, uh, they shot the president. And then we walked over and looked down and could see the people on the grass there. And I imagine you were one of the people that we saw there yeah, that was, uh, that underneath was, the viaduct. This, um, uh, this happened this afternoon about, uh, what time, 12.35, the president died at some like it was at 1 o'clock. They sounded like, uh, at first they sounded like firecrackers, and somebody <clears throat> next to us said they are shooting off fireworks. But then we realized, uh, it didn't take but a minute to realize that they were... Uh, loud reports, and for those of you who are familiar with hearing a rifle shot, it was uh, the re recognizable sound. The videotape that we have, Bobby, what do you have now? Okay, the, that is, that completes the videotape coverage for the moment. We will have film back um, in about 15 minutes of the arrest of a person who could be the person who shot the policeman or the Secret Service man or Conley or President Kennedy. And we'll have that in just a moment. Now let's go back to ABC in New York. Wasn't that incredible? Yet Abraham Sapruda in that film, and he's talking candidly, I mean, hours after this, about the assassination. And it's firsthand. I mean, he's telling you exactly what he saw. Now, he was looking through a viewfinder of this little camera here. He wasn't just staring with his own eyes. Now, if you look through this, you could still see what happened. You didn't need binocular vision from yourself to see that. He had one eye closed, and he looked through this viewfinder, and he still told a story. He still told exactly what he saw. And because it was being filmed, they could analyze it a little bit more. But that, that video that I just showed you, that clip, was so fresh, and his interview was done solely... They must have just had people outside this studio that had seen this, or have done and he was one of them he was one of these people that came into the studio and not knowing it was just abraham sapruda it could have been mary jane it could have been father john it could have been anybody but he came into that studio not knowing what he had so in the long run after the film i guess sooner or later it would have been developed it was developed okay and then the fbi starts to get a little bit involved they want to know who had what where were they and what did they have now we're going to look at there were still photos there were photos done by uh, polaroid cameras they were popular at the time there were some handheld cameras and then there was video cameras which during that assassination only one or two video cameras were rolling it was this one and there could have been possibly another video camera we don't know that we don't know that because no other video footage has ever showed up of the assassination from a different angle or any other angle. It was done on top of the abutment with this camera. It was at the right level. It was at the right height. It was at the right exposure. And he had the best film possible in this camera. He didn't have black and white film. He had color film in here. 
Now, color film came in late World War II. They were using it, you know. Color film was available, but it was an expensive process. It wasn't like black and white. It was a little more expensive. Now, what we're going to take a look about is the after thing. After this camera had filmed that assassination, you know, Life Magazine. Here comes Life Magazine. Now, Life Magazine, uh, this was the biggest story on the planet. Any information about this uh, assassination is big bucks, even for back then money. Now, Life Magazine swooped in and tried to buy the rights for the film, in which they did. He wanted to sell the film for $50,000. It was uh, a smart buy by Life to do this. But then they uh, recognized a deal would uh, give Sapruder six annual payments at $25,000 each. That's what he wanted. But Zapruder still kept the original film and the original, somewhat of the original rights to the film. Now, uh, the first $25,000 that he got, uh, now he was a Jewish man. You have to remember back then it was, uh, you know, you, you're talking about communist. It was big in communist. He's commies this, commie that, you know. It was big on that. But the, he was a Jewish man. Now, a Jewish man making a film and now all of a sudden going to Life magazine and selling the rights of the film. Now, Somebody ain't going to like that. You got a lot of these people that came back from World War II. They don't like Germans. You know, there was Germans in America that didn't like Jews. There were Jews that didn't like this. Now, it just was bad. Here's a Jew trying to a Jewish man trying to sell his film. I mean, right away. I mean, it just didn't look good. So what he did is he gave the first $25,000 payment that he received from Life magazine. He gave it to uh, Tippin. He gave it to Tippin's wife. Now, Tippin was killed. He was shot by Lee Harvey Oswald when he was walking down the street. I think he was either, uh, I think he was going or I think he was leaving the assassination. He was stopped by a police officer. I think it was a, a J.P. Tippin, I guess what his name was, but I just call him Tippin. And uh, he was, uh, his wife uh, was a widow after that. He was deceased. He was killed. He was shot with a 38 caliber victory cut revolver. Uh, that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald had bought, and he modified himself. It was a World War II 38 model uh, victory model revolver. Now, you could have bought that anywhere. You could buy those from catalogs, and he, you know we all know he bought the rifle from a catalog. But Zapruder, because he didn't want to have a really bad name, gave him $25,000, gave the family of Tippin, and especially the wife, the money so that it didn't look as bad as it did, because Sapruda wasn't in it for the money. He said multiple times that, you know what, if I'm going to donate or give this film, I want it to go into the hands of the right people who are going to respect the film and not exploit it. The big thing with him was the exploiting of this film. Now, during, uh, during I think he died, I think, uh, you know, Abraham Sapruda, I think he died in 1970. Don't quote me on that, too. But I think he was, uh, he found himself... Uh, you know, he was uh, still a dressmaker. I don't think he gave his career up or anything, and he had saved that money. I don't think he squandered the money at all. But, you know, the American public got a look at the film at ABC's Good Night America. And this was with Geraldo Rivera. You're talking way back. And it, mar it aired in March of 1975. That's when they released the film. They released the whole nine yards of that film all from beginning to end on that broadcast in 1975 and then uh, the copyright the original copyright after that aired uh went back to the sapruder family for one dollar they uh they they sold the rights back to uh abraham sapruder's family now he was deceased by then this is 1975 uh, for one dollar, but uh, he did die. Abraham Sapruder died of stomach cancer in 1970. So uh, he didn't. Uh, he did what he had to do. He sold the film. He got money for it. Uh, you know, he he got. Uh, I guess he got twenty, fifty, a hundred thousand, and then one twenty, twenty-five thousand went to tip. And so he, he cleared about a hundred thousand dollars of back then money. You're talking, you know, sixty-four, sixty-five time frame. You know, uh, the Sapruder family capitalized on a film, and they, they acquired the copyrights, and uh, the son uh, rented the film out to a one-time viewing, uh, and although estimates are a, an exact uh, Oliver Stone, that was the movie, uh, JFK itself, he lead, the son of Abraham Sapruder, uh, 
said you get a one-time viewing of this original film. So Stone paid $400,000 to use the footage in his JFK film. Now, he had the copyrights. The copyrights were sold back to the Zapruder film in 1975 for $1. Now, that whole family said, hey, we're going to let this happen. We're going to let the film go into JFK because Oliver Stone was a great director at the time. And, you know, he worked with the family. And $40,000 uh, is not a lot of money. It's kind of like, you know, we're just giving it to you. I would have done it for absolutely nothing. I would have just let them use the film uh, with 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 no restrictions at all because it is so historic. I don't need money. I don't want the money. Uh, I want the world to see my uh, my father's film. So then it, it, that movie, uh, the film JFK, was a, a humongous hit. It started a lot of different uh, conspiracy theories. It started a, a whole new direction. I mean, Kevin Costner in that film was absolutely great. He did a wonderful job. But now you're having different uh, conspiracy theories there's different things that are going on there and we didn't know i mean when you watch that film you, you leave that film it's a i think it was a four-hour film you leave that film going hmm maybe that wasn't the way it happened but you know from uh you know uh, reports the the commission the commission's report you know states one thing and then you know this film comes along and it says other things but to get back to the film it was Definitely, they paid, uh, the studio paid uh, the, the son of Zapruder $40,000 to use the film. So, then in 1997, uh, the Assassination Records Review Board, uh, the original copy of the Zapruder, was in the hands of the family itself. And what they wanted to do, they the film by that time, in 1997, that little tiny reel of film. Now, if you have 8mm film of... Uh, your grandparents are uh, your you know 70s early on 70s film if you look at that 8 millimeter film if you grab it and you touch it it can crack because it was a celluloid type of film it was a very thin film it wasn't like we have today we have synthetic films this was a very thin film now when it was first purchased it had strength it had flexibility to it but over the years Humidity, dampness, uh, where you kept the film, all contributed to the, this film starting to deteriorate over time. Now, in, seven, in 1997, they didn't want to play the film. They didn't want to make any more copies. It was deemed by uh, you know d different uh, outlets. They took it to the National Archives, and they said, we don't want this film to deteriorate any further. Now, this is the original. This is the original film that was inside that Bell & Howell camera, uh, in, in that infamous day. Now, the National Archives uh, took the film and uh, they took it for safekeeping. And uh, now, the Department of Justice and the film, uh, the Zapruder's family, they, uh, they gave them some money for the film. Now, it was a lot. Now, they fought over this too because the, the, the film was like a Van Gogh. Now, the film, they just didn't want to give it to the National Archives. They wanted the, the federal government, if the federal government, because this was part of the assassination, it's evidence, as far as uh, Oswald, you know, his rifle was evidence. Uh, you know, you had the revolver that killed Oswald, that was evidence. You had this camera, even had stickers on it that showed that it was evidence. And that infamous roll of film, it was evidence. But uh, what happened was uh, they had fought uh, the federal government. I think the federal government, uh, they wanted to give them $1 million for this film. And this is 1997 money. $1 million. We're going to take the film, all rights, everything away from the family. Now, they countered offered that. Like I would have done too. I would have countered offered. I wouldn't have taken a million dollars because it, he, they say that this is like the, it's like a Van Gogh. It's a it's it, it's priceless. There's you cannot put a price on something that will never ever be duplicated. You can't duplicate a Van Gogh. You can't duplicate this film. So the government came back many uh, a few months later. Uh, after a, uh, it wasn't months. It was more like years. After a couple of years of haggling, the, f the federal government finally approaches the Zapruder family and offered $16 million payment for the film in 1999. That's many years from 96. So they held out. You know, I don't know, if you were broke and, and maybe had problems or something like that, uh, you, you would take a million dollars really fast. But 
That's a Pruda family. I'm sure that that father told the son, I'm handing you something that is irreplaceable. You do not, under any circumstance, give this for anything unless it's what it's worth. So they got $16 million in 1999 for the film. Now, the fee only paid for the physical copy of this film. You know, you're talking about one little roll of film. So they sold the physical copy of the film, but the Zapruder family maintained ownership of the copyright, which is wonderful. So that's why Oliver Stone, when they were filming that, they the Zapruder film, the Zapruder family, I'm sorry, owned the copyright. So they couldn't show it. They could not show that film unless they went to the movie studio, went to the family and asked for those rights to be given to them to use that 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 motion picture, that 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 little eight millimeter reel. And they did. And like I said, it was forty thousand dollars. Now, what happened to the camera? What happened to this camera? Did it go into the National Archives? Because this is Abraham Zapruder's camera. This is his property. It's his. He owned it. It was his camera. Now, the camera is infamous, too. Like I said, I have it right here. We're talking about infamy. The camera's here. And uh, basically, what happened with the camera... So he took everything that he had. Clippings. Uh, 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 paper clippings about him. That video that we just saw of Abraham Sapruda. His actual physical camera. And all the documents... Um, uh, uh, all the documents that he signed or had in his possession, and also photos, he donated to the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. So there's a little museum on the sixth floor, and he donated everything he had. I, I think that it was the son, it wasn't Abraham Sapruda, but the son donated everything that was in his uh, father's archives, including this camera right here. This camera right here, if you go to the Dealey Plaza Museum, you'll see it in all its glory. It was the exact camera that was used during the filming. And, uh, you know, I'm just thinking to myself that, you know, infamous items. Infamy is what you make it. Infamy makes an item infamous by what it does for history, to history, or, or, or does something else that is infamous. But for history and to history makes this item special. Now this is an extremely special camera and I'm so happy to hold on to this and enjoy it and to hold it and show people that you know this is just not another camera that you buy at a yard sale. It's not one of those cameras that you pick up at an antique mall because this camera uh, if you're not you, if you don't know what you're looking for you'll walk right by it. You'll look at this camera and you'll say wow they don't make film for that anymore or You'll buy this camera and you'll use it as a bookend because it is flat. You can just put books against it and it's for decor. But most people don't know that what they buy is the exact camera that Sapruda did to film that infamous film so many years ago. So that's my uh, that's my video on this infamous camera. It's a very uh, it's a very interesting thing. There's some things I touched on, some things that I didn't touch on. But I'm going to put together uh, some other things that we're going to be taking a look at. But I wanted to do this one tonight because I feel like this one's a really good one. So you guys have a good night.